Welcome back to Beyond the Headlines. I'm Cheryl Jennings. We've been talking about family health, but we're going to switch gears right now and talk about eating disorders. And for that, we welcome Jennifer Lombardi of the Summit Eating Disorder and Outreach Program in Sacramento. Jennifer came all the way from Sacramento to be with us today, so thank you for that. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, this is a really important issue, and, and you have been a person who's suffered with an eating disorder. Tell me about that. That's correct. Um, between the ages of about 17 and 22, I did struggle with anorexia. Um, and unfortunately, at that time, treatment resources were extremely limited where I grew up. Um, but that's changed a great deal in the last, I'd say, especially 10 to 15 years. Um, and so fortunately, with a lot of support from family members and loved ones, uh, as well as the support of a very good therapist, I was able to fully recover, which is what prompted me to get into this field and do this work. Sure, and for people who don't know what that is, can you describe it briefly? Sure, um, there are different types of eating disorders, specifically with anorexia. That's for an individual who tends to restrict their food intake, mm -hmm. um, eat a very limited amount um, to almost nothing on a daily basis, um, sometimes engages in compulsive exercise, sometimes some compensatory behaviors, but typically this is a person who would lose a significant amount of weight in a very short period of time. And were the influences around you, images on TV, magazines and that sort of thing? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I think oftentimes in our culture people assume that it has something to do with vanity or our society. And the best way that I can explain it to my patients and to family members is to kind of think of an eating disorder like a puzzle. And there are five pieces to that puzzle. Um, the number one and most prominent area is looking at genetics. And we know now in the last five years with research that people who struggle with eating disorders, whether it's anorexia, bulimia, or even binge eating disorder, usually have a family history of anxiety or depression, which was certainly true in my case. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but then in addition to that, that, the second piece of the puzzle are personality traits. And people with eating disorders tend to be very driven, people-pleasing, um, very perfectionistic, but also extremely sensitive. And then the other three pieces of the puzzle, we look at culture. Um, certainly our, our society doesn't cause eating disorders, but it certainly creates a very toxic environment um, that gives you know, young, young women and men ideas about weight and appearance that are oftentimes extremely negative. And are then the other the, two. Are they the most at risk? You you know, it's interesting. I would say the average age of onset historically has been between 14 and 16, um, but there's also another spike between the ages of 18 and 22. Hmm. And if you think about those two periods in life, there's a number of changes that are occurring, you know, both hormonally in terms of puberty, but then also in terms of life expectations. And again, like I was saying with the personality trait piece, people with eating disorders are extremely sensitive to change and conflict. And so for them, it's much that much more magnified during those times in their lives. Tell me about your treatment program. What's involved there? Uh, we offer a number of different levels of care and we do treat all different types of eating disorders. Um, we offer a partial program um, which is a five day a week program where patients are with us throughout the day. They receive a high degree of medical treatment. We have a nurse and medical assistants that are on staff every day. They see a physician, psychiatrist every week and then in addition to that they get individual therapy, family therapy, nutrition counseling, support groups. We also do yoga and Pilates, uh, meditation, those kinds of things and that's our highest level of care. We can treat uh, both adolescents and adults and then our step down program from that is our intensive outpatient program which usually ranges between 9 and 15 hours a week so for most patients um, that come into our program regardless of what level of care they start at we tend to sort of step them down um, as they are let become less symptomatic and more stable do they slide back you know, relapse is a part of recovery, unfortunately. Um, with our patients, you know, what we tell them is, with re what we know now again through research, is that if they are able to maintain abstinence from their behaviors for the, a good year, their chances of recovery are extremely high. Um, but during that first year in, in the recovery process, there can certainly be some difficult moments. Um, and that's especially true, I think, for the age brackets that I mentioned, because those are times in life that are filled with change um, and potential conflict. Conflict. And so whenever, you know, things like that happen in a person's life, uh, you know, you sort of, you tend to revert back as a human being to the thing that provides you comfort. Right, right. So, so what's the best advice you could give to somebody who might be watching you right now? Uh -huh. about 30 seconds left. You know, what I tell patients is to have hope um, that people real, really do recover. I mean, I've been recovered almost 18 years and I'm certainly not unique. Um, there are many people that work in this field who are recovered um, and would tell you the same thing. Um, but you don't recover in a vacuum. You do need to have a high degree of medical supervision, psychotherapy and nutritional counseling to do that. That. All right. Well, I'm glad your program's around to help. Thank and I'm glad you're doing better, too. Thank you very All much. Right. And we do have to take another break. We will be back, though, with more Beyond the Headlines in just a moment.